Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the online voice of Ecclesia Teaching Center. I trust that everyone is seeing my screen. Uh, grace and peace to you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brother Michael. In one sense, we are continuing to look at various myths and misconceptions. Today, today, we are going to take a close look at a passage of scripture that is as misunderstood as it is popular. Very popular, very misunderstood, amen? Christian and non-Christian alike, millions have heard the verse quoted and just as many are able to quote it, but very few understand its true meaning. I ask you to patiently, bear patiently with me as we go through this teaching. Please follow along carefully and prayerfully, and we trust that the Lord will speak, amen? Well, the passage of scripture we have in mind is none other than John 3.16. And which says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16, almost everyone knows it. You see, if we were to, if we were to to say John 3.16 a little differently. This is the way in which God demonstrated his love for the world. He delivered up his only begotten son in our place, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So what we, what we are dealing with in today's teaching, today's lecture is, Understanding John 3.16. So let's get right into it, please. I'm thinking that most of the confusion may lie in the word, meaning of the word world. Much of the misunderstanding also lies not only in the meaning of the word world, but in recognizing the scope of God's love. Is God's love big enough for everyone? Yes, of course it is. Of course it is. But is there a limitation to the scope of God's love? After all, you know, isn't God love? That must mean that God is love all the time and to everyone, right? But this is faulty religious reasoning. It's the same kind of reasoning that imagines that God, being a God of love, I've had people tell me this, will never punish anyone in hell forever. They aren't going on what the Bible says. They're going on their emotional assessment of who they think God is. They see this God as allowing punishment for a time, but eventually those being punished will be purged and allowed to go free from hell. You see, they, they may even quote passages such as 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. I mean, after all, this does say that in Christ shall all be made alive. Or some may even quote this passage, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. I mean, doesn't this passage say what John 3.16 is saying or seems to be saying? All it does is to use different words. After all, God is love. And that God has made provision to reconcile the whole world unto himself. See, part of the reason why many cannot see the error in their interpretation of these passages is because they think of salvation as being a sort of buffet. 
I can tell you without even meeting them in person, uh, every last one of those who misinterpret John 3.16 sees man, the sinful man, as having the final say in his salvation, or to be more precise, in his regeneration. They see salvation as being like a meal that God has laid out, and it is up to man whether or not he wants to partake of the meal. They see the sinner as making the first move, and God as acting in accordance with the will of the sinner, no longer according to his own will, but in accordance with the will of the sinner. And well, let me, let me show you this. You may or may not have heard it. The whole deciding vote heresy. You know, it says this way, you go out witnessing, so you tell the unsaved man, God has cast a vote for your soul. The devil has cast his vote for your soul, but the deciding vote is yours. See, I, I can't even begin to tell you how very wrong this is. And those and, and, and those who follow this advice will end up in hell, just like the many others who follow the same advice. This is not biblical truth. See, if you were, if you were voting on an important piece of legislation and you were convinced that the ideas of one of the candidates were foolishness, would you vote for him? Hmm? Would you vote for him? First Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You're not going to cast your vote in favor of foolishness. The Bible tells us the natural mind cannot comprehend the things of the Spirit of God. It cannot understand the gospel. It is foolishness. You will need spiritual discernment to understand the plan of salvation. For us to understand the full picture, we will have to do an entire series of teachings on John 3.16. But first, let's exegete 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 22. Exegete. Wait a minute. What is that? what it means to extract the true meaning of a passage. See, in, in 1 Corinthians 15.22, it only appears to say that in Christ shall everyone receive eternal life. It only appears to be saying that Christ has made provision for everyone to have eternal life. What it is saying is that just as all of those who are in Adam die, just so will all those who are in Christ be made alive. How do you get into Christ? You believe into him. So 2 Corinthians 5.19 is no different, really. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's not saying that everyone in the world has been reconciled. It, it is, if that is so, then no one will suffer the wrath of God in eternal damnation. Because the verse plainly says that God is not imputing their transgressions unto them. This is not true of everyone, as we see in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, Paul, Paul is, is repeating what David said. Uh, he's repeating it. He said, even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So according to David, this is true if you read, if you read from verse 1 in chapter 4, this is true only of the children of Abraham. In other words, it's only true of those walking in the faith of Abraham. Because to, to have your transgressions forgiven is to walk in the blessing of Abraham. And verse 19 of 2 Corinthians 5 is repeating the thought of John 3.16. But it is not saying that God has been reconciled to everyone. But, you know, uh, no more than John 3.16 means that 
God loves everyone with a reconciling kind of love. When God looked upon fallen mankind, it was his desire to save the whole world. But in the sense that he will save a representative, a sampling from every single family tribe, people in town, and those whom he actually reconciled to himself, he has actually given them the faith to respond to his call. See, God, God left nothing, no stone unturned. Christ paid for everything. Acts 2.39 says, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord or God shall call. In other words, it, th th that's what it says. So God's going to give you faith to respond to his call. And if God has given you that faith, you're a child of God, okay? Because it, it, is by, it is by grace that we are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. God gave you that faith. If the promise is towards you, God provides you with the faith to respond, the grace to believe. And what is the promise? Well, the promise is otherwise known as the baptism in the Holy Spirit, regardless of what some religious groups try to tell us. Please understand the divine sequence. Heaven initiates, earth responds. Heaven acts first, earth responds. There is a divine cause and effect. The sinner is locked up in a prison house of sin and death. Sinful man cannot decide on his own to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He cannot decide on his own to be reconciled to God. God has to make the first move. It's cause and effect. 1 John 4.19 tells us we love him because he first loved us. You see, if God loves everybody in the world, then everybody in the world will love him in return. Because the love of God triggers love in the heart of the recipient. You are transformed into his image to the extent you understand and have experienced his love. That's why Paul says in, in, in Philippians chapter 2, he says, listen, if there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, in other words, if you experience these things from God, if you experience these things from God, okay, here, here's, here's what to do. Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded. If Christ has shown you these things, be like-minded, have the mind of Christ towards others in, in the area of these things. Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. What does that mean? If you have experienced the love, patience, and mercy of God in your life, immediately look for opportunity in which to express that same love and patience to others. And what happens as a result? You grow into the image of Christ. But let's get back to John 3.16. What does it mean that God so loved the world? Well, it means that God loves the human race and was determined not to bring upon mankind final destruction like he did with the fallen angels. This brings up another point. Seeing that God is love, isn't he also the God of the angels? He simply did not have a redemptive plan for the fallen angels, but he did have a redemptive plan for fallen man. Remember that when God made the promise to give his son for the redemption of mankind, only two persons were alive at the time, Genesis 3.15. Adam and Eve were the whole world. But God had determined that there would be those selected out of the masses of fallen mankind, whom by his grace, were to receive the reconciliation. He also determined that there would be those whom he would bypass and leave in their sin. That's just the fear of God. You see, part of the problem with the common interpretation of John 3.16 is the assumption that fallen man can, whenever he feels like it, just choose to believe in God. They assume that when the Bible says that Whosoever believes in him should not perish, that anyone can believe whenever they want to or choose to. 
they fail to take into consideration the spiritual condition of fallen man. They fail to see man as being spiritually dead with the inability to comprehend or understand spiritual things. They fail to understand that faith comes by hearing and both knowledge and understanding come by hearing. But the spiritually dead are spiritually deaf and cannot hear what is being said when the gospel is preached to them. You say, well, no, nah, that's not true. That's not true. They can hear the words you're speaking. Yes. But just to hear with the outward ear is not the kind of hearing that brings faith. Many teach that all the sinful man has to do is draw upon the faith that is in his own heart. But this is false. The Bible does not teach, treat faith as something that can be worked up mechanically. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of God's people think faith is something that they have to squeeze out of themselves because they were told faith is a force. And it's like squeezing toothpaste out of a tube. So there's a struggle to have faith. That's not faith. Okay? And the, the, the Bible does not treat faith as something that can be worked up mechanically. But this heresy is thanks to the so-called faith teachers. What the Bible teaches is that faith is not worked up, faith comes. Faith cometh by hearing. So when the scripture says that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, what it is saying is that whosoever God gives faith to shall never perish. But for God to give faith to you, he has to first cause you to hear his word. If, if, if God loved everyone in the context of John 3.16, then he will give everyone the ability to hear the word of the Lord with an inward hearing. But does he? Seeing no one can have faith apart from knowledge and understanding, and no one can know or understand apart from hearing, then what does, what does Romans 3.11 mean? What is it trying to tell us? There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. We are going to have to play with the meaning of the word none. It means that if you cannot understand, it is because you cannot hear. Let's hear what Jesus has to say to the unbelieving Jews. John 8, 43. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Why, why were they not able to hear his word? Because he was with on, on a mountain or in the house or why? Simply because spiritually speaking, they were spiritually dead, deaf and blind. See, why do you not understand my speech? And I'm gonna give you the answer, because you cannot hear my word. I have not given you the grace to hear my word. Hearing you shall hear and not understand, seeing you shall see and not perceive, See, can you see that to say whosoever believes is the same as saying whosoever has been given the ability to hear. Let's look at another passage, please. Remembering that this is the same John who wrote John 3.16. All he is doing as he keeps writing is to continue to clarify John 3.16. Let's, let's listen in. Let's listen into what John is saying. John 6, 39 to 40, verse 39. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me. Notice heaven must act first. Heaven must act first. Heaven prior to everything else existed, even before the heavens and the, even for the earth, the sun, moon, and the stars. So heaven determines who will be saved even before they are born. All, and this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he has given me. This is very crucial. We look at things from the point of view as, were you given to the Lord Jesus Christ? Of all which he had given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Let's turn to verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him 
may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. The, I, I mean, are you, are you reading this in light of John 3, 16? You know, we have to be careful what you think whosoever means. See, please note, there is no distinction in the eyes of the Lord between those who believe on him and those whom the Father has given him. There are just two ways of describing the same group of people, namely, those whom he will raise up on the last day. Let's do it again. Verse 39. This is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he had given me, I should lose nothing, but should what? Raise it up again at the last day. Verse 40. Verse 40. Well, look at that. Isn't that something? I just had verse 40 here. All right. <clears throat> there, is, there is no distinction. There are just two ways of saying those whom he will raise up in the last day. In other words, those who will not perish but have everlasting life. Let's take some time to look at the word world again. What does it refer to and what does it mean? First of all, it does not refer to the geographic landmass of rivers, lakes, oceans, mountains, valleys, suns, moons, and stars. I submit to you that the word world primarily refers to the human population, the inhabitants of the whole world, the, the whole earth, the human race. The Bible seems to suggest that the heavens and the earth as we know it shall perish in a sense of being all burned up. Well, let's see. Let's see what, what it says to us. Second Peter 3 verses 10 to 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heaven shall what? Pass away. Well, you know, pass away. It's 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 a it's a, another way of saying die. The heavens and the earth are going to perish, but pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. All right, they shall be burned up. Verse eleven. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? All right? That means no part of us should be identified with the world system because it's going to be burnt up. Okay? Verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire, think about it, the heavens, the sun, moon, and stars are going to be on fire, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Let's go to verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dreadeth righteousness. So you see here we have the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. But this brings us to another consideration. We, we, we know that God is love, but exactly who are the objects of his love? To understand this, we need to look at the word gave. What does the Bible mean when it says that he gave his only begotten son? Hmm? What does it mean when he says he gave? What it means is that God delivered him over to judgment. He gave him up to become a curse. He gave him up to be abandoned and forsaken by God. He gave him up to be the ransom. He gave him up so that he would bear the full force of the wrath of God on behalf of those he came to save. This much is clear. God's handing his son over to judgment was motivated by his love for the world. Not every single person in the world 
but those selected ones who will make up the new heavens and the new earth in the age to come. Now here's the question, does God change? Based on the understanding that many have of John 3.16, if that understanding is correct, here is my question. When did God begin to love the world? Ever thought of that? When did God begin to love the world? Did God begin to love the world only in New Testament times? For instance, did God love the world in the days, in the days of Noah? Remember, God does not change. In the days of Noah, we had the world that then was. Let's, let's turn to 2 Peter again. Let's turn to 2 Peter. Chapter 3, verse 6, whereby the world that then was, the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Whole world perished. And then after the flood, we have the heavens and the earth, which are now, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So let's do this again. In the days of Noah, before the flood, we have the world that then was. After the flood, we have the heavens and the earth, which are now. Remember, we noted that the love of God did not extend to the angels. Now, why was that? Was it because they were angels, disembodied spirits? The Bible simply says that God spared not the angels that sin. Look at, look at chapter 2 and verse 4. Let's take a look. For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. But see, the Bible reveals that there was a world before Noah's flood, and there is a world after Noah's flood. Let's look at verse 5. God spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Okay? brought in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Now, now, now let's say, notice how John 3.16 did not apply to the old world. The, the phrase spared not, spared not the angels of sin, spared not the old world. The phrase spared not means that God did not have a plan of salvation for them. Notice again verse 4, please where it says that God spared not the angels of sin. The very same sentence construction is used in verse 5 when it says he spared not the world, which means that God did not give his son for the salvation of the old world. Notice how the old wise God describes Noah in verse 5. Notice, notice it. This is the point we're making concerning John 3.16 about the heavens and the earth, which are now. There are some whom God has no interest in sparing their lives. God does not change. It was so back before the days of Noah. It is so now. As a matter of fact, Jesus warns us, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. There are some whom God has no interest in sparing their lives. The world may change from the old to the now, but God does not change. And just like those of the old world, there are those in our time whom God is not giving the ability to know, hear, and understand. He is only giving these blessings to the new creation. Remember what we said. Notice how God describes Noah when he speaks of the old world he chose not to spare. He called Noah the eighth person. Noah represents the new creation order. He was a type and shadow of the new creation. When we look at the total number of persons to enter the ark, we see there was a total of eight. Eight is the number of new beginnings. 
God spared not the old world except for Noah because only Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let's look at Genesis chapter 6. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, divine intercession went up on behalf of Noah and those in the ark. Everybody else perished. God interceded on behalf of Noah just as the Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf right now. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Do you see the Old Testament type and shadow? Hang in there, it'll come. In the old world, you had Noah and his family in the midst of the people, in the midst of the social order. And whosoever, whosoever believes and enters the ark will not perish. We know that Noah preached the gospel because he was a preacher of righteousness. God had made provision only for those in the ark. There is intercession for Noah and his family only. But these were types and shadows of our day. Now we live in the days after the flood, in the heavens and the earth which are now. Just as in the days of Noah, God is preparing an ark in Christ Jesus. In Noah's day, you entered the ark by faith, believing that it would protect you from the raging storm. In our day, you enter the ark by believing into Jesus. You know, Romans, Romans 1, 17, 16, I, I mean. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto. You see, it, it takes you unto that place of salvation. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. So you, you see, but as it was in the beginning, only those who find grace in the eyes of the Lord are actually brought into the ark by the power of God. Let's, let's, look, at, let's look at Ephesians 2 8. For by grace are you saved. Noah found grace. If we are saved because we found grace, not because we made the decision for Jesus, we found grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Notice how in the Old Testament, God spared not the old world. Notice how in verse 5, they are specifically identified, not just as the world. Remember that God does not change. Seeing that God so loved the world, we have to identify which world is being referred to. Seeing God destroyed the old world, which world exactly did he destroy? Is there more than one world? Yes. Just as there are two Jerusalems, two Mount Zions, two Israels, two ages, two kingdoms, at least two Jesuses, two gospel messages, a true and a false, and the false is subdivided into very variations, Islam, Hinduism, Jehovah's Witnesses. You see, they are just as they have two of these things, they are two worlds. One of them is getting ready to perish, and the other one is getting ready to be restored in the times of restitution of all things. One of them is called the world of the ungodly. And the other one by process of elimination is the world of the godly, otherwise known as the kingdom of God. Just as in the days of Noah, when Noah found grace in the eyes, I want to find something for you, if, if I can. If I can't, well, here we go. Note well. Spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon what? Which world? See, Noah was safely in the ark and with his world, but the other world, the flood came upon them. Which world was that? The world of the ungodly. So we always have to be sure that we identify which world we are referring to, especially when we read such passages as John 3.16. You see? Um, so, uh, just as in the days of Noah, when Noah found grace in the eyes of God, when the world of the, of the godly, made up of only eight persons, were placed safely into the ark. Just so now the Lord Jesus Christ has made it clear that he will not pray for the world. Oh, wait, 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 hold on, wait. 
wait a minute. Um, that's, that's huge. If Jesus says he is not going to pray for the world, that's huge. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which you have given me, for they are thine. Wow. Wait a minute. Exactly which world do you suppose that the Lord Jesus Christ is not praying for? Exactly which world do you suppose has not found grace in his sight? The world of the ungodly or the world of those who were given to him by the Father? Seeing the Father delights in the Son and the Son does nothing but the Father's will, do you believe the Son will refuse to intercede on behalf of those whom the Father wishes to save? If it is true that the Father wishes to save everyone, if, if, if it is true that the Father wishes to save everyone, you see, then uh, we have a problem. And this is the difference between Peter and Judas. They both betrayed the Lord, but only one of them found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Christ interceded for Peter only. Judas was from another world. See, he told, you, he told Peter, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not, and when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. Let's, let's look at the concept of world from another angle. The religious leadership brought Israel to a place where it became focused on itself alone, me, myself, and I. They ignored the plain teachings of Scripture and gave God's word a totally different slant. For instance, Genesis 12, 3, I will bless them with bless thee, curse him that curses you, in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. This passage was clearly intended to highlight Israel's responsibility to so present the truth of God that the nations would see their example and walk in the light of the Lord. Now, even Christian churches who should know better interpret this to mean if you bless the Jews, God will bless you. If you curse the Jews, God will curse you, which is nothing but, but Zionist propaganda. And when, when in all is, is, it is saying is that if the children of Israel walk in the footsteps of their father Abraham, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Instead, what happened, instead of walking after Abraham, they walked after the Pharisees and got lost. And then what happened with Romans 2.24? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. <clears throat> so you see, the Jews portrayed God as being for Jews only. Gentiles were considered to be less than human and unclean. They totally misrepresented God's intention towards the Gentiles. Totally. Even though the prophets said over and over and over, says, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be acceptable upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. All people. So seeing they ignored the writings and the prophets, John sought to remind them that God is a good God who seeks to extend his mercy to the Gentiles as well. So when John 3.16 was written, it was meant to convey, convey the message that God does not just care for Jews, God cares for the whole world, meaning every nation, tribe, and town. If you go to Acts 1.8, you shall be witnesses, the very last thing Jesus told them, one of the last things, you shall be witnesses unto me. You see, the, the, Lord, the Lord has made provision for the redemption not only of those in Jerusalem, but also in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You know, may God continue to open the eyes of our understanding as we read passages like John 3.16, so we can explain it to our friends and to our loved ones or relatives, so they may come into an understanding. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, that brings us to the end of tonight's lecture. Thank you very much for your patience.